been a long time since I've been this excited. And this is the first time we've done a review video from Games Workshop in quite a while. Um, it's something I've been meaning to do since going full time. Um, and I've been trying to work out a way of doing it that's different to the other videos that you see out there in the community. And this time I couldn't resist. So this is a last minute.com thing. I wasn't going to do this, but because it's this book, I just had to review it. So the first thing I need to say, I have to say this, legally I have to say this now, is this was kindly sent through to me by Games Workshop for free to review for them alongside a number of other things. So they've sent me the new Dark Reapers, the new Guardians, the new Warlock kits. And if I get the chance, I'll photograph them in the booth below and show them. They're not painted, they're just put together. I have to say, I have to say, they are absolutely glorious, glorious kits. The Guardian kits are stunning. The Reaper kits are really, really cool. The Warlock kits are amazing. There's just... It's just positives. The kits are just incredible. That's after we've had, obviously, the new Rangers, the new Shroud Runners, and the new Autark. Amazing job, GW. Amazing job. So as I said, in today's particular video, we're going to be reviewing Codex Aldari. It's not Codex Craftworld Eldar anymore. It's not Codex Aziani. It's Codex Aldari. And that's an important distinction to make because no longer does it just contain Craftworld Eldar. In fact, in terms of thickness, we've compared this to the Space Marine Codex, and this one is, in fact, slightly thicker. Um, so assuming the price point will be about the same, Good value for money. It's not often we say that, right? So in reviewing this book, I want to do something normal to what you typically see on YouTube. So YouTube, we typically see someone read through the codex for an hour and 20 minutes, tell you everything, read all the stratagems out, read all the psychic powers out and go, oh, that combo's good, oh, that combo's good, oh, this could be strong. I don't want to do that. There's a number of reasons. One, it's already been done to death. Two, it takes forever. And three, often we get those combos wrong as reviewers and it's only when the book is in the hands of the best players in the world do we start to see the actual true powerful combinations coming out of the codex so i'm not going to profess to try and tell you what those best combinations are instead i'm going to go through a number of areas that i'd like to look at and i'm going to do it in threes and i'm hoping we can keep this format going forward in new reviews of other codexes and other products if you love it please let me know in the comments below if you like it if you'd like to see things done differently if you think there's things i could add or remove please let me know in the comments below i won't always definitely follow your advice I just might not, I'm sorry, but it would be super interesting to hear if you guys think this is a good format for a video or not. So, the things I've picked out for Codex Aldari. Three biggest changes, the three biggest winners, the three biggest losers, the three main things to look out for, and my three favourite stratagems. I think that probably covers most of the key and important aspects of the Codex. Clearly there are relics and there are warlord traits, etc. Again, I could tell you my favourite, but then the video just becomes mammoth, and we're going to try and keep this one quite short, so that it's a nice snappy review, so people can go, I like this book, I don't like this book, I think I might pick it up. So straight into the three biggest changes. The first main change, well this book... This is an interesting book. I've been a Craftwell player for a long time. I've been a Harlequin player for a while. Um, I've never really played Yunari. The reason why I'm bringing all three of those up is because all three of them are crammed into this singular codex. So this is kind of Codex Space Elf now. It encompasses everything Space Elf with the exception of just the Drakari. So the Drakari still have their own book, the book we saw earlier in 9th edition. This one now covers everything else Eldar. So Craftwell Eldar, Harlequins, Yunari, all in this book. So that's the biggest change to date. All three of them are combined into this one singular codex. Now, if you're a Harlequin player, you might think, well, is it worth picking this up? That's something we'll go on to later. There is still a lot of Harlequin stuff within the book, including lore and narrative, which is quite important. But it being a combined codex is a big deal. And it makes quite the difference as well, because when you consider things like stratagems that were typically used across all of the factions, well, you only need one stratagem in one location now. And if they make a change to that stratagem, they only make one change to one stratagem in one location. Much tidier, much neater. I'm definitely a fan of that. So my second biggest change to the Aldari rules is the introduction of the Runes of Fate dice rolls and the luck of the last and god dice rolls now you're probably going to see this across all manner of reviews however i'm going to briefly touch on them today this is kind of eldar's super mechanic it's their super doctrine this is what they get now as opposed to uh, extra chapter tactics etc so we still see craft world attributes for um Simhan and for 
Oathway, etc. But this is their super doctrine. So if a unit have the, has the Strands of Fate ability, then they can be impacted, affected by this particular new rule. So what essentially happens is at the start of each battle round, an Eldar player will roll 6d6. Each of those d6 will obviously harness a result of some kind, a 1, or 2, or 4, or 5, whatever. Each of those results corresponds to a particular type of dice roll in the game. A charge roll, a damage roll, a psychic test. Okay, And there's a, there's a few others, obviously. There's six of them in total. So there's six different corresponding types of roll to those particular D6 results. Depending on the size of the battle, you can keep a number of those dice in your pocket, and they basically become kind of miracle dice. If you've ever played Sisters of Battle or Adeptus Sororitas, which you would prefer to call them, they're kind of miracle dice. The difference being, instead of them representing the dice roll that you rolled, they represent a six in the respective type of dice roll that you rolled it for. So if you got a result that would relate to a charge roll, you can use that dice roll later on in your game to, to be used as a charge roll. Now, you do this every battle round, and they, I think they reset every battle round. And there's a couple of slight changes. So if you have a Farseer in your army, for every Farseer you have in your army, you can re-roll one of those um, fate, fate dice, I've called them. You can re-roll one of those fate dice and then and therefore change it. So if you might get a charge roll, you might think, well, I don't need a charge roll. It's battle round one. I'm not making any charges. I'm going to pick that one up. I'm going to re-roll it because I've got a Farseer. Oh, good, it's a psychic test. Perfect. That's important. If it's a psychic test, for example, because it's 2d6, you use that dice as a dice roll, that counts as a singular 6 in a 2d6 roll, which means you only have to roll 1d6 and you add that to a flat 6, meaning your minimum psychic test will be a 7 because you've used a fate dice. Again, having a Farseer being is important because you can manipulate those by re-rolling them, that's amazing. If you're Ulthway and you're running Eldrad, you also get to keep an additional one, that's a big deal, because in a strike force game, so up to 2,000 points, you keep four fate dice out of the six you roll. So you discard two, you keep the other four. If you have Eldrad, you discard one and you keep five of them. That's a big deal. Manipulating five dice rolls, a battle round, to a six is massively powerful. Very narrative for Eldar. I quite like the rule. It's also simple. It's not too overcomplicated, like things like Crossfire, etc. So I'm a big fan of it as a rule in the Codex. Along with fate dice, and I'm coupling this into a single change, is the luck of the Laughing God dice rolls, which are for Harlequins. So if you run pure Harlequins, you get these dice rolls, and basically you get three re-rolls per battle round in addition to your normal command point re-roll. Um, so you basically can use them for the standard things that you use for command point re-roll, so a hit, a wound, damage, etc., um, which is really nice, but you only get three. However, you can choose to make a Luck of the Laughing God dice roll. If you do that, you can grab any number of dice between, I think it's like two and six. It might be one and six. It might actually literally be one and six. And you roll those number of dice. So say you've picked three dice. You roll three dice. If every result of those three dice that you rolled is unique and therefore a different number to another dice that you've rolled, you get that number of Laughing Dice again. So if I roll three dice and I get a one, a four, and a six... They're all different. I gain three additional luck dice. That means I have six luck dice that turn. Six free rerolls that doesn't include command point rerolls. That's important. It's a big deal. I can get up to nine. However, I'd have to roll six dice and rely on every single dice roll being unique. Supremely rare you're going to do that. You're typically going to see a couple of doubles in there, maybe two fours. The second you see two fours, you don't get that many of extra luck dice. Okay? So you're rewarded by rolling more if you get lucky and you get unique ones by having more rerolls, but there is also that risk that you're going to have duplicates and therefore you might actually fail and stick with your basic three. The mechanic's cool, but I don't like it because I don't really typically like rerolls. Rerolls is something that I think we use too much of in 40k, but it is a cool mechanic. Point to note, if you run a pure Aldari detachment or pure Craftford Eldar detachment, you get fate dice. If you run pure Harlequins, you get luck dice. If you run a soup list, and you follow the rules in this codex for running soup, whereby you can add a patrol of Harlequins to your patrol of Aldari, or Aziarni, then you will still get strands of fate dice, you don't get luck dice. If you run more than a patrol of Harlequins, you will not get either, because it breaks your army's keyword. Okay, that's covered in the codex. I'm not going to bore you the details, but basically you can roll a patrol you can run a patrol of Harlequins with your Aziani detachment and not break the army keyword and therefore keep your strands 
uh, of Fate Dice. You can't use Strands of Fate Dice on Harlequin's units. You can only use them on Aziani units or Yanari, which is important, but you can't use them on Harlequins. The third biggest change is around the Psychic Trees. So um, Eldar used to have the Runes of Fate and the Runes of Battle. They now gain the Runes of Fortune as well. So Farseers now have access to Runes of Fate and Runes of Fortune, which means there's a potential 12 Psychic Powers rather than the flat 6. And they've made some big changes to Psychic Tests like Doom and Guide and Fortune, etc. So I'll give you a for instance. Doom used to be cast on a 7+, plus. you pick an enemy unit within 24 inches and you can reroll all wounds against that unit. It is now changed. Doom still has a casting value of 7. If you cast it on a 7 or more, you can pick an enemy unit within 18 inches, and all Aziani core or character units can reroll wounds against the selected enemy unit. If, however, the psychic test is a result of 10 or more, you then can pick an enemy unit within 24 inches. So now it's going to become really key and really clutch to remember to roll for your power and then select your enemy unit because you might get that extra six inches of range. That's a big deal. Also, changing it to only core and character is a good move and a strong move, but it does make Doom less effective. But we do now have two trees, so the runes of fate are now in there as well as the runes of fortune for Farseers. So never forget you've now got access to 10 psychic powers. And typically a Farseer, it says you can cast a number of powers or you can cast two powers, and you know two powers from the runes of fate and or fortune disciplines. That's really nice for our Farseers. So for me, there are three of the biggest changes. Um, when you guys finally get your hands on the book, comment below. Let me know if you think there are bigger changes and more important changes. Um, but that, for me, are the three main changes that I noticed straight out of the box with this new Codex. So we're going to move on to the three biggest winners. What are the three biggest winners within Codex Aldari? And I've... <laughs> One of them is a unit, one of them is a type of unit. You'll get what I'm saying. So the first, the biggest winner for me at the moment in Codex Ardari is Aspect Warriors, which is amazing because I don't think we saw as many of them as we could. Um, and Aspect Warriors are super narrative for Eldar, but they have definitely become a winner in this book. Um, they have got a number of um, increased sort of damage output and, and buffs to their stat profile. But the biggest thing is for Aspect Warriors is they've all gained an Aspect Armor save, which is a 5-plus invulnerable save. So Aspect Warriors were always very good in terms of their damage output previously. However, typically, they would fall over to a stiff breeze. Giving them that 5-plus invulnerable save, I think, is actually quite a big deal. If you also look at the Phoenix Lords, the Phoenix Lords have all gained a rule called Favoured of Cain because they're an Aspect Phoenix Lord, which means they gain a 4-plus invulnerable save and they can't lose any more than 3 wounds per phase a la Nightbringer. However, they are a character at less than 10 wounds and do benefit from the Lookout Sir rule. That's super powerful. Not only is that powerful, but now each Phoenix Lord confers objective secured to its relevant aspect. So if you take Jane's R and 20 Banshees, those 20 Howling Banshees all become objective secured. That's why I think Aspect Warriors are one of the biggest winners in the new Codex. Another one of the biggest winners in the new Codex for me is Wraith Constructs. Wraith Constructs across the board have seen a massive boost to their resilience, and that is in the form of a minus one damage ability, um, basically called Wraith Construct. This is for everything Wraith. This is the big deal. So it's not just Wraith Guard and Wraith Blades. This is also for Wraith Lords, for Wraith Knights, and interestingly, for Hemlock Wraith Fighters. So Hemlock Wraith Fighters now also have that minus one damage, just boosting that resilience. If we look at the Wraith Knight, the Wraith Knight now has an inbuilt 5 plus invulnerable save, which it never had before. You used to have to take the Scatter Shield to gain that. It's now built in. You can still take the Scatter Shield, but it becomes a 4-plus Invulnerable save, which is super nice on a Wraith Knight. Additionally, with Wraith Knights, you were very limited just to the weapon combinations that you can take. That limitation has been lifted. You can take a Ghost Glaive in one hand and a Wraith Cannon in the other, should you so choose. The other thing to note is with almost all ranged firepower for Wraiths, um, on sixes to wound, they now do mortal wounds. If it's a humble wraith cannon on a normal wraith guard, it's a single mortal wound. If it's a wraith cannon on a wraith knight, it's d3 mortal wounds. It's just nice that they gain that mortal wound output in addition to make those wraith weapons super frightening. However, I am someone who's anti-mortal wounds because I think they're everywhere and I don't like that. But that does make them a winner, though. It does make them a good unit. It does make them a strong unit. So I think wraiths have had a real birth in the new codex, and they weren't terrible before. The final big winner in this codex is going to surprise you. Because I think it's busted. I think this is broken. I, I will categorically state that I think this is a broken unit, and I think that we might see a significant change to this unit in the past. That's the Webway Gate. The Webway Gate at launch is 80 points and is ridiculous. 
you can deploy them over objectives now, which you couldn't before. Once you deploy them, they can't be destroyed. They count as scenery. They offer benefits of cover to your units, and you can deploy out of them using certain units. Not only can you deploy out of them using certain units, but you can also deploy basically in engagement range. It's ridiculous. What you can do with a webway gate now is mental. It's insane. Check it out. Read the rules for it. I guarantee you we're going to see webway gates everywhere if they remain with these current rules at this price point. And so now we're going to move on to the three biggest losers. Um, this is this was hard to do because the codex is very, very, very strong. It's a good book. Most things have changed in a positive way, in my particular opinion. However, there have been some losers, some things that have changed in a negative way. If you look at damage output, might be positive for the game, but they are a negative change for that particular thing. The first one we're going to touch on is Wraith Weapons. And I've just told you that Wraith Weapons are much better, right? Liam, what are you talking about? I'm on about D sides and heavy D sides. So D sides were on Wraith Guard, heavy D sides on Hemlock Wraith Fighters used to be an auto hitting weapon. That's now gone. They're a heavy D6 blast weapon now. So that is a loss for Wraiths. They were, D sides were so good because they were auto hitting before. Hemlocks were so good because they were auto hitting before. I still think they're both incredible units and I still think they're both great weapons, but they have definitely seen a bit of a nerf by changing them from auto hitting flamers to blast weapons. So that's a loser. You can tell I'm already clutching at straws, right? Second biggest loser in the codex, Harlequins. Now, are they a loser per se? It's they just some players are Harlequins players and they don't want Craft Wild Eldar. And so now they have to buy this giant Eldari book to get access to all their Harlequin stuff, and it's no longer just unique to Harlequins. Now I think this is a positive. I think this is a bonus that you buy the one book for the one price point and you do get access to everything. And like I said right at the start, the fact that they can combine stratagems now, and there's one update for each stratagem rather than three updates because the stratagem appears in three different publications, I think is a positive. But Harlequins don't have as many things as they used to have in the old Harlequins Codex, as well as the supplement that came out subsequently, which was in White Dwarf. So they've got less rules that are just for Harlequins. And so Harlequins players may feel like they've lost a little bit of flavour, a little bit of love from Games Workshop. So I guess you would consider that a loss for Harlequins overall. To be clear, the majority of the Harlequins rules we've come to know and love still remain things like rising crescendo and flip belts they still all exist harlequin still move like they moved they still hit like they used to hit so most of that is still good however i just think having not their own codex some harlequin some purely harlequins players are going to feel like they've lost a little bit of their own sort of carved out path in the universe because they don't have a book that's bespoke to them finally and i've coupled these together because i couldn't decide which was the biggest loser here there are two other losers one is simply from a modeling perspective. One is simply because they've just got worse, basically. So we're going to touch on two units, Viper Jet Bikes. Now, Viper Jet Bikes, you didn't see commonly anyway. They weren't a really common choice, but they did exist. The thing with Viper Jet Bikes is you used to be able to take a Shuriken Cannon on the back and a Shuriken Cannon under slung. Now, we've seen the updates to Shuriken Cannon weapons, right? And we've seen these in the new codex. They've become AP-1, they've become a flat 2 damage, and they get AP-3 on on sixes to wound. So people would have been dusting off their old Viper jet bikes with two shuriken cannons. Apart from in the new book, you can't take two shuriken cannons. So so Viper jet bikes used to come with a shuriken catapult underslung, a cannon on the back, and you could upgrade the back weapon, upgrade the back weapon. In the book, you could upgrade the nose weapon, but in the box, you could only upgrade the back weapon. You'd have to find another shuriken cannon from somewhere. Well, clearly Games Workshop have noticed this, and they don't want to give you options that you can't buy in the box coughs in chaos terminator so they now have removed the option to change the chin weapon the chin weapon will remain as a shuriken catapult so all those people that spent all that time converting their viper jet bikes to two shuriken cannons you need to change them they're not allowed anymore it's a bit of a loss that one the other loss is dark reapers inescapable accuracy for dark reapers used to mean that no matter what they targeted they would always hit on their ballistic skill of three plus this made dark reapers an auto include in every list however now inescapable accuracy only means that they ignore the benefits of dense cover so if you're firing through dense cover that would offer you a minus one to hit to your ballistic skill you now ignore that and that's it so if you're firing at aircraft that give you a minus one to hit because they're hard to hit Dark Reapers now suffer that penalty, which makes them categorically worse. Not only that, 
but no longer can they be taken in a minimum size unit of three. They're now in a minimum size unit of four plus an X arc, so five. So they now become less points efficient for your Reapers as well. You have to buy five a time. So if you were to used to be, if you used to be a player who would take three units of three, now if you take two units of five, you're paying more points already than your old three units of three. Okay, so Reapers have lost out. So although that's some negatives, we've got some positives. There's some units to look out for. I've picked three units to look out for in the new Codex um, for Codex Aldari. The first one, do you remember 7th edition? Do you remember 30 Warp Spiders? If you've kept those 30 Warp Spiders, then you're in the money because I think Warp Spiders are going to be huge again. Genuinely, genuinely think they're going to be really, really good. Why are warp spiders so good? Well, they're warp jump generators. They now move 12 inches and they basically count as jump pack stroke fly. So they no longer have that six inch foot move that they've got in the current codex. So they're highly mobile, very, very quick. They're death spinners, which used to be assault two, strength six, AP nothing, one damage. And on sixes to wound, they would do AP minus four. Well, they've changed. They're now assault D6 blast weapons that are strength six with a flat AP minus two, one damage. So their firepower has got significant be better um that just makes them incredible that level of maneuverability plus the fact they've got that warp jump generator is incredible that warp jump generator also allows them to advance or battle focus 2d6 instead of d6 if you do that if you use a warp jump generator if you roll a double one you will suffer a mortal wound to the unit which will kill a warp spider because they're on one wound each but let's not also forget they've gained that aspect warrior bonus of having a five plus invulnerable save and flicker jump is changed as well the first time they are targeted for a charge they can flicker jump and move out the way so they can move further back make your charge distance longer and give you more chances of failing that charge warp spiders got good i think warp spiders are very good now so my second unit to look out for is night spinners night spinners are good now i think they've just got a lot better they've gone up to a 16 inch move characteristic which is a big deal because i'm pretty sure they're currently at 12 but more importantly there's been a change to their doom weaver now they're still a 48 inch range they can still fire out of line of sight and they're still blast they've remained at strength seven and they've kept two damage the things that made them popular already however they have lost the ability to get ap minus four on a six to wound and just gained a flat ap minus two makes them really really nasty i think we'll see lots of night spinners we saw them anyway i think we'll see lots of night spinners now my third and final unit to look out for on the tabletop for eldar is howling banshees if i was looking to build a fresh eldar list right now i'd be using three units of banshees i'd be cramming in jane's r why banshees are disgustingly good now in my opinion they've gained an additional attack from their previous profile so they've gone from two attacks to three attacks each they've gone from strength three to strength four with their banshee blades and they get plus one to wound on the charge so strength four ap minus four plus one a wound on the charge one damage is pretty tasty already when you're considering three attacks per banshee but let's not forget Jane's R can make them obsec. They have a five plus invulnerable save now. And in addition, they've got their Banshee masks. Banshee masks are insane. If I charge you and I have a Banshee mask on, not only can you not fire Overwatch, nor can you set to defend, but once I'm in combat with you, you are, if, enga if in engagement range, not eligible to fight until all other eligible units from my army have fought. So it's what we call a super fights last. Basically, if I plow Banshees into melee with you, you cannot select them. You can't pay 2 CP to interrupt. You can't do any of those shenanigans that lets you fight before my Banshees are fought. So I am always, always going to get to hit you first with those weapons that are now strength 4, 3 attacks each, AP minus 4 and 1 damage. That's really, really, really good. There's a couple of cool Exarch powers in there as well. You can make a Banshee Exarch um, that allows the whole unit to have a 4 plus invulnerable save in melee, which is quite nice. There's another one that allows you to give a Banshee Exarch plus one damage. So if you take the Executioner, the Banshee Exarch can have four attacks with a strength five or six, AP minus three, three damage Executioner. Banshees are amazing. I wouldn't be surprised if we see them all over the place so we can shut people down and stop them from fighting before maybe things like Wraith Blades, etc. get into melee. So that's the three units to look out for. And because I don't want to make this video monumentally long and I already think it's been about half an hour and I also want to add a review at the end, like a wrap-up, we're going to touch on three stratagems that I think are important 
in this codex. Now, first is lightning fast reactions. Lightning fast reactions existed in the old Eldar book and it went up to two command points and all up to two command points because lightning fast reactions is really, really good. Guess what? It's back down to a single command point. The only thing that can't be targeted for lightning fast reactions is monster units, but basically if you're targeted in the shooting or fight phase for a single command point, you're able to make your unit minus one to hit. It went up to two because it was too good. I'm not sure why it's gone back down to one, but it has, so so be it. The second stratagem that I think is a big deal is matchless agility. Matchless agility is a single command point, and for a single command point, you can count your battle focus move as a flat six inches. Now, battle focus is not something we've covered yet in this particular video, but Warhammer Games Workshop, they have shown us what battle focus is. Battle focus is one of those rules in the codex that's made Aldari, in my opinion, exceptionally strong. So basically, once you've shot, if you haven't advanced, you can then perform a battle focus move where you can move up to D6 inches in any direction. So you can poke out from behind a ruin, shoot your weapons, jump back behind said ruin. That's a big deal. That's a really big deal. Matchless agility for a single command point means you can guarantee that's a six inch move. So if you need that little bit of extra movement to go outside that ruin just to get into range or get that line onto your opponent, and then you can guarantee a six inch move back behind the ruin, it's a lot safer. People are saying, well, battle focus isn't that great because if you roll a one, you can still be stuck outside of cover. Not if you can auto do it six inches. We still also have fire and fade in the codex. So by also having fire and fade, you've got access to another stratagem that allows you to move seven inches after you've shot your weapons. So with two CP now, you can basically guarantee that two units can jump out of cover, shoot, jump back behind cover. There has been a change to fire and fade. Fire and fade now no longer allows you to get back in a transport in the shooting phase unless you're a Harlequin's unit. So I have typically got my Reapers out, shot, and in the shooting phase, fire and fade back into the Wave Serpent. I could do that because I wasn't embarking and disembarking in the same phase. Lightning, fire, not lightning fast reactions, fire and fade now specifically states that I can't do that unless I'm a Harlequin's unit. So that's a big deal, it's a bit of a change, but that's two units that you can jump out and jump behind ruins and keep them relatively safe. So the final stratagem for me, I don't know if this is amazing or it's rubbish and I just think it's amazing, but it's called Eldritch Storm. Eldritch Storm is a kind of version of a super smite. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to grab the codex and read it to you because if I try and just regurgitate it right now, I'm probably going to get it wrong. So Eldritch Storm is a big deal at three command points, um, but I like it. So you use this stratagem in your command phase if a Farseer model from your army is on the battlefield. Select one point on the battlefield within 24 inches of a Farseer model from your army and place a marker on that point. In your next psychic phase, so this is after your movement phase, it's the same turn, it's not another turn. In your next psychic phase, Farseer models from your army that are within 24 inches of that marker can perform the following psychic action. In Power Storm, psychic action, warp charge value of 5, any number of Farseer models from your army can attempt to perform this psychic action. So if you've got three Farseers on the board, you can do it three times. Let's not forget that with Eldrad, three foot Farseers and three bikes Farseers, there is the potential to have seven Farseers on the tabletop. At the start of your next shooting phase, roll 1d6 for each unit within six inches of the center of the marker. Now, this is still the same turn, so it happens in the command phase. You then get to move. You then do these actions in the psychic phase, and in the shooting phase, it's resolved. So your enemy does not have the chance to react, respond, or move out the way of this. So at the start of your next shooting phase, roll 1d6 for each unit within six inches of the center of the marker you placed, subtracting two if the unit being rolled for is an infantry character on a 2 plus. That unit suffers D3 mortal wounds and an additional one mortal wound for each time the Empower Storm psychic action was successfully completed this turn. That marker is then removed. You can only use this stratagem once. There's a reason why they've made it once. That's a big deal. So if you've got, so let's say you have Eldrad Ulthwin, a Farseer on foot and a Farseer on bike. It's not completely uncommon to see this. So you pick a marker within 24 inches of Eldrad, or pick a point, and you place that marker in your command phase. In your movement phase, you can then move your foot seer and your bike seer to both be within 24 inches of that particular marker. You can then perform this Eldritch Storm action with all three of your fire seers. They all cost five warp charge. There is no mention that the warp charge cost goes up like smite, so each of them do it on a five. And if you've successfully completed the action three times with three Farseers, every enemy unit within six inches of that marker will suffer 
D3 plus 3 mortal wounds in the shooting phase. Now, don't get me wrong, you're doing a psychic action, so you won't be able to do any other psychic powers. You won't be able to use Dark Doom, Guide, Fortune, Smite. Um, you could potentially do one of those additional powers because there's a single command point strategy in the book that allows you to do a psychic action and then do another psychic power. But you are shutting down the rest of your psychic capability. But if they're castled together and you can do three plus D3 mortal wounds to every unit within six inches and there's four or five units, that could be a really clutch psychic power, um, I, or a stratagem, I should say. I really love it. I really like that psychic power stratagem thing. So there we have it. That's my 15 hot takes, I guess, from Craft World Eldar. Um, I don't know if I add another three of something else or another three. So I was looking at relics, and I was looking at warlord traits, and if I start to add my three favourite warlord traits, my three favourite relics, one, I start to get myself really bogged down in the codex. And secondly, there isn't enough warlord traits and relics to really pick a hot three out of. With stratagems in this particular book, there's six pages. Let's not forget the Harlequins and the Inari in here as well. So there's six pages of stratagems. So picking three out of those six pages, it's a tough choice. Thricking, picking three units out of I don't know how many data sheets there are, is a tough choice. Picking three out of the warlord traits where there's kind of like eight or nine, it's not so much of a big deal. So I'm quite comfortable that our, this is our 15 hot takes from the Eldar Codex. Now, what do I think of this particular book? If I compare it to Tau and I compare it to Custodes, I'm not entirely sure that in the wrong hands, at least, Eldar are going to be anywhere near as competent as those other forces. The bonus I think we have with Custodes and Tau, I say bonus, some of you might consider this not a bonus, but the thing I think that is the bonus with Custodes and Tau is I do think that inexperienced players can pick those codexes up and still do okay, stroke do quite well with them, and semi-competent players can be at the top of the leaderboard with those particular codexes. With Craftfold Eldar, will we see them at the top of the leaderboard? 100% yes. Will we see them at the top of the leaderboard with inexperienced or semi-experienced players? I'm not so sure. I still think Craftfold Eldar, to get the most out of them, you have to be a good player. I still think they are a finesse army. And as a finesse army, what I mean is if you throw your Aspect Warriors out there, even with their newfound 5 plus invulnerable save, you're going to find you're picking models up quite frequently. And if you don't quite get your positioning right and you allow your opponent to charge your units and tie up your units and, and get to you quickly, I think you're still going to struggle with Eldar because they are still quite weak defensively unless you're running a wraith heavy army um, and even then i don't think a wraith heavy army has all the tools required if you just ran wraith heavy to to play 40k hyper competitively in ninth edition i will state when people like your manny Kimas get hold of this book book they'll be top tier Eldar are going to be top tier. There is no doubt about it. They are going to be a super strong faction. And when you see some of the shenanigans that people will do with Eldar, I think we may still be back in a place where people go, oh, Eldar, I don't want to play Eldar, because they are just incredibly strong in the right hands. Like I said, still think they're glass cannon. I still think in the wrong hands, they won't look that great. But when your good players get hold of them, this book is going to do some work. On the whole, I think Games Workshop have done a top job in this codex. Um, there's a couple of little things I'm not a massive fan on. There's an error or two we found as well. So, for example, Harlequin troops in this codex, currently in their keywords, don't have the core keyword. Which means the only core keyword unit in the whole of the Harlequins book is the Skyweaver Jet Bikes. I can't believe for one minute that a troop master is supposed to offer aura rerolls to Skyweaver Jet Bikes and not to Harlequin players. That's an obvious mistake. It's an obvious missed keyword from the troop datasheet, which is a shame. There's a couple of little mistakes in there. However, I'm not going to slam them for that. That's a quick fix in an FAQ, which I'm sure they'll sort out pretty sharpish. But it is an error nonetheless for a heavily playtested codex. That being said, combining the three, combining Inari, Harlequins and Eldar into one book, I'm hugely for that. If I wanted to play Yanari with Harlequins units and Eldar units and Drakari units, I now need two books rather than four publications to play Yanari. That's a positive step. That's got to be a positive, right? In, in an edition where we're whinging about how many books there are, that's positive. I'm an Eldar player and a Harlequins player. I just need that book now. That's positive. I don't need a Harlequins book and an Eldar book and have to look in two different places. That's a positive step. I don't need to worry about if the stratagem has been updated in one book and not in the other. That's a positive step. Cramming it all in there is amazing. Top job, GW, for that. I'm a really, real big fan of that. Massive, massive fan of the new Plastic Reapers that I've been building. Massive fan of the new Plastic 
um, Rangers, and a huge fan. A lot of people said, I don't know if the Guardians needed it. I'd rather have more Aspect Warriors. I do agree I would rather have more Aspect Warriors, but the Guardian unit is gorgeous in itself. The only thing that makes me sad is Striking Scorpions, Warp Spiders, Swooping Hawks, still fine cast. They couldn't, they couldn't develop those as well. <laughs> That's it, though. And the other thing is a Sherman. Like, I really wanted a Sherman to, um, to have a new plastic model. And, and to be fair, a Sherman is broken good. So what do I give this book? Out of 10, what do I give this book? Well, I'm going to give it a 9.5 out of 10. It's a high score. It's high praise for Games Workshop. Maybe I should go down to a 9. Okay, I'm going to go down to a 9 out of 10. Why am I going to a 9 out of 10? So I originally came to 9.5 because of a couple of little mistakes, like the missing of the core keyword from the Harlequin's Troop data sheet, because it's a printed book. So it's hard to modify that and get it right. Now, that book is null and void at the point in which it comes out. That's the reason for the half a point dropped. The reason for the other half a point dropped is I think that potentially in the right hands, this book's going to be too strong and it might be toning down a bit. However, I've given it a higher score because one, the book is beautiful. Two, there's loads of really positive changes some things have been toned down where they need to be toned down some things have been powered up where they need to be powered up and if i look at some of the points values for certain units in this codex i actually think that we're not going to get as many things for our points as we thought we would and that's probably what's going to help us balance the eldar codex because things are expensive reapers going up to um five man units at 35 points a model is an expensive unit of dark reapers for a toughness three elf with one wound right so i think there's some balance there so we'll go nine out of ten it's a top tier codex in the in the i think it's frontline that use the s tier a tier b tier c tier they're an s tier codex i guarantee they're going to be an s tier codex they're a super strong book if you're an eldar player pick it up if you're a harlequins player pick it up if you're a um what's the other one a Unari player there we go i got it out eventually pick it up i don't think there's any reason if you're an eldar fan not to pick this book up especially if it comes out the standard codex price point big fan of this book Big fan of Craft Worlds anyway. Can't wait to get all this grey Craft World plastic painted up and get it out on the channel. Anyway, guys, let me know what you think of this review and let me know what you think of this format in general. I'm keen to know if you think this was valuable, if you gained something from this, if you found it interesting, and if you want more of these types of reviews. I don't really want to go down the route of just reading the codex out to you because I don't like that very much. Um, personally, I don't even like watching it, let alone making it. But I will take feedback on board and we may make some changes in the future to the next set of reviews. Um... Over time, as I get more used to this, I'd like to have it slightly more produced with some panning shots and some... But we, we need baby steps, right, team? Baby steps. We'll get there eventually. So let me know what you think. I will be sticking photos of the new models that I've been making, most definitely in the Great Hall Discord, which is a Discord server for my members of the channel. If you want to support the channel, if you want to support the streams, if you want to support these reviews, if you want to support what we're doing here... Um, on the channel that you can become a channel member for as little as two pounds a month you get access to a discord server and there's other benefits depending on the level that you choose equally another way of supporting the channel and the probably the best way for you is to come and join us in the deployment zone so if you go to www.deploymentzone.tv um, you can hit the big join us button and start a seven day free trial if you start that seven day free trial we won't take a penny from you you get seven days to look at all the content we have on that website and if you love it you can stick around stay a dztv member join the dztv discord Come and join all the cool kids. So all the cool kids hang out. Um, if you hate it, however, and you want to cancel for whatever reason, then we don't take a penny until after that seven-day free trial. So I'd urge you to try and um, try and use the website. No, I would urge you to give us a try and have a look at the website. That's probably a better way of wording it, right? Um, all the links that you need to support me and support DC TV are in the video description below. I hope you guys have enjoyed this, and we'll see you in the next one. Oh.